a little bit about how cells are organized. Um, so the idea is that after finishing this set of slides, you should know appropriate microscopes for specific applications. You should know the differences and similarities between the two major cell types, cells without a nucleus called prokaryotes, or cells with a nucleus called eukaryotes. Describe the organelles found in the eukaryotic cell, and I'll talk a little bit about their function, and provide examples of structure and how it relates to function uh, in different cell types. So all living things are made of cells. We talked about that in the first day of class. This idea that in order for something to be considered alive, it has to have a cell. So because things like viruses don't actually have a cell, we don't often consider viruses alive. Things like prions that cause bad pathogens also do not have a cell, so they are not considered to be alive. What they're showing you here are different types of cells. Uh, the first in panel A are nasal sinus cells uh, viewed with a light microscope, and we'll talk about different kinds of microscopes. Uh, in panel B, we have plant cells. These are specifically from an onion. These are also viewed through a light microscope. That's the most common type of microscope that you would use in any of your courses in your labs. Um, most people who have a research lab that use microscopes also use light-based microscopes. Finally, in panel C, you have a type of bacterium belonging to the genus Vibrio. Um, Vibrio can cause significant human disease. This is another cholera caused by a different type of Vibrio bacterium. And these cells actually been imaged with a type of microscope called a scanning electron microscope. And so this is just, you know, an example of an animal cell. This is supposed to be an example of a plant cell. Of course, here is a prokaryotic cell that has no nucleus. And there are lots of reasons that people want to look at cells. And so scientists have had to develop tools in order to make that possible. So microscopes work mostly on principles of physics. much, but it basically has to do with the light spectrum. So for humans in particular, we see uh, what we call the visible light spectrum uh, from the shortest wavelength that we see is going to be like these kind of deep circles. Um, so at a wavelength of approximately 380 nanometers, uh, we can see up through the reds which have a longer wavelength, about 750 nanometers. When you're talking about the wavelengths of light, when you have a short wavelength, that has a lot of energy. A longer wavelength has lower energy. So just beyond what we as humans can see in terms of uh, shorter wavelengths are uh, UV. So we actually can't see ultraviolet rays. So again, when we make these types of, we call it the visible light spectrum, it really should say visible light spectrum is for humans, um, because lots of animals can see UV. Birds are across the field. So we can't, our, our eyes just cannot process this information. Uh, longer than red, you have infrared, and microwave radiated sunlight. So because of the visible light spectrum, and because of the wavelengths of light that we can actually detect, with the unaided human eye, we can only see things to about a certain size. And by see it, what I mean is, we'll talk about this in the, in the upcoming slides as well, but there's a property called resolution. The ability to tell that two objects are actually distinct. So if I you know, took two people and lined them up, even if I had them stand right next to each other, 
similar height, similar weight, similar coloring, similar clothing. You could tell them apart. You could say there's two people there. But the farther and farther away you get, the harder and harder it is to see the individual people. You lose resolution when you have more distance. Because humans are a limited size. If you look up into the Sierra, you see, well, I'm not looking around, but sometimes you can see a lot of green. You know it's trees, but those trees are too far away for you to see the individual trees. You cannot resolve an individual tree until you get closer. So when we lack resolution, we can't see the individual components. So I can look at all of you and I can see you, but I don't see your cells. Your cells are too small and too far away for my eyes to even touch. So what scientists had to do was develop tools to allow them to see these smaller things, to focus the light more appropriately and to artificially make that thing bigger. Right? Like I can't see Saturn with my naked eye. Eh, you can sometimes if you know exactly where it is. But I certainly can't see the rings on it. It's too far away. My eyes are not strong enough to see the individual rings on Saturn. But if I go to River Park and look through one of the telescopes that they set up, I can. So these tools can help us see things that we normally couldn't. So planets are really big, of course. If we wanted to focus on things on Earth, there are lots of small things, including our own cells, that we can't see with our naked eye. And so we take advantage of mostly glass and the bending of light to magnify these small things so that we can see them um, in the lab. So the unaided human eye and the light microscope have a little bit of overlap. So there are some things that you can see with your naked eye. You can see them better and in more detail using a microscope. But there are other things that your eye just can't separate out. You have to use a microscope for it. So most plant and animal cells, um, one of the exceptions would be, um, depending on how big your eyes are, you can sometimes see a human egg. If a human egg is even big enough that you can see it. Uh, cellular organelles, like a nucleus or mitochondria, bacteria can't be seen with the naked eye. Um, and so we have generated tools, microscopes, to magnify these objects so that we can see them. But unfortunately, because we are humans and we are using our eyeballs to look through a microscope, we're still limited by that visible light spectrum. And so at some point, no matter how many lenses and how much magnification you try to put on something, you're not going to be able to see it any better because the energy necessary for you to see that is of a wavelength that's so short you can't you can no longer detect it you just can't you can't use light anymore to help you see so in this case scientists have then developed tools called electron microscopes electron microscopes are not based on visible light right, because we can't see Instead, they're based on the use of electromagnetism. So electrons, it's basically you shoot a beam of electrons. And because those electrons have such a tiny wavelength, right, they're so energetic and they have such a short wavelength, um, they basically reflect a message back to a computer which translates that message into an image that we can understand. So when we're looking at electron microscopy, you're not actually looking at the object, you're looking at what the computer thinks the object looks like because of the way the electrons bounce off of it. It's like sonar. Right? You picture a submarine that shoots off pings and, oh, there's a blue whale. Well, how do you know it's a blue whale? Because the pings were coming back at different distances or you, know, you can scan a map mirror and you can throw it out. You don't ever see it, right? but because of how the computer interpreted the feedback, generate something. But even then, there still are limitations. Using electron microscopy, we can see very, very small bacteria that you can't see using light microscopy. 
you can see viruses. You can see really small organelles like a ribosome. You can see proteins and lipids, but small molecules and atoms you still can't see the light. We don't have the technology to do that. So microscopy, no matter what kind, um, takes advantage of wavelengths and energy. So if you want to see something really, really well um, that's very, very small, you have to have short wavelengths and lots of energy. So the process of microscopy, it magnifies whatever it is you're trying to look at. It makes it look bigger without actually making it bigger. This is not like the way it works with onions and potatoes. Right, if you're looking at bacteria under a microscope, they look big, but they're not big. They're still the same size. We're also talking about this idea of resolution. You want it to um, be clear enough that you can distinguish two individual entities. So sometimes you can magnify something so it's bigger, but it's like super pixelated. And you can't tell exactly what entity is in there. So if you just magnify something, but you don't improve the resolution, you'll never get to see how the image is really coming from. And then finally, just to make it even more difficult, you have to magnify things, you have to resolve them, and you have to do that using contrast. You have to be able to tell um, the object you're looking at apart from the background. And sometimes that's easy. Sometimes you're looking at something that's colored, like a red blood cell. But sometimes you're looking at something that has no perceptible color, like a bacterial cell, or maybe some of your other um, body cells. So in that case, you can use artificial dyes or stains to highlight the object that you're looking at. So you have to have magnification, resolution, and contrast in order to visualize something that you can't see through the cell. So light microscopes, this probably is something you might have used in high school, you use it in um, all your biology classes. They use um, beams of light on the wavelength spectrum to help you magnify, resolve, and therefore visualize whatever it is you're looking at. You can use light microscopes to view living organisms. Um, but again, the trick is that third factor that you need contrast. Um, a lot of individual cells are transparent, so you have to stain them because you can't see them otherwise. Um, but if you stain them, you kill them. So it can sometimes be tricky to look at living things under a light microscope, but there are modifications to light microscopes that do allow you to see um, living organisms functioning as they should. It's always really cool to look at a sample of pond water and you can see this water. And it even looks clear, you're like, oh, look at that clear, clear water. This would be really great to drink from a nice mountain stream. And you put it on a microscope and it's all good water. It's <laughs> um, But staining will sometimes kill the specimen. And so then you lose that ability to see how it would have been functioning normally. So when you take a class like microbiology and you have to look at bacteria under the microscope, you've already killed them. So you don't get to see how they really would behave in their normal system because you can't see them. So that's, you know, the pros and cons. It can be hard to look at some living things simply because they are too small, they are too transparent. But in pond water, sometimes the living things have chlorophyll because they do photosynthesis, so they're really easy to see. So that's always fun. I briefly told you about electron microscopes. So instead of using light to visualize the specimen, you use a beam of electrons. Um, that's an example of what an electron microscope looks like. To kind of put things into perspective, um, a classic light microscope that you have in your biology lab generally will only magnify up to a thousand times. Something like a scanning electron microscope, more like 10,000 times. A 
transmission electron microscope, 50,000 to 100,000 times. So the resolution and the magnification are incredible with these electron microscopes. Downside is, in order to visualize something, you need an electron microscope. Um, for scanning electron microscopy, in order to get the electrons to the active specimen, you usually coat it with a heavy metal. So if you're looking at bacteria, you have to coat them with something like gold or palladium. So you might need to put a bunch of palladium on a bacteria to melt it. And not get hot. So it also kills the specimen. So there is that downside. But again, being able to see these structures using the scanning or transmission electron microscope has taught us a lot about how bacteria function, how viruses because without these technologies, we wouldn't be able to see them. So it would all just be conjecture. So a light microscope versus an electron microscope. These are images of the same bacterium. It's salmonella. So salmonella is a gastrointestinal pathogen. Um, what you are looking at in panel A is uh, salmonella in over here, right, these are all the salmonella, and they're trying to invade uh, in human cells. But when you look at it under the electron microscope, um, you can see the flagellum, so these structures that they need to move. And these are all of the folds of the human cells that they're trying to invade. Um, so you get really incredible detail. Here they just kind of like blobs. I told you they're salmonella, so you're like, what the hell? But when you see them here, in these electron micrographs, I show you this, you're like, yeah, that looks like a bacteria, I buy that. Here, you just have to take my word for it. So the idea is, yeah, you can see similar things on a light microscope and an electron microscope in terms of, yeah, I see salmonella. Um, but they look so much better under electron microscopy. Now, when you try to do microscopy and you don't have stained samples, that can be really difficult. So this is a conventional light microscope like the one you might have in your lab and you're looking at a sample of what you can't tell it's like oh yeah there's bubbles cells i don't know i don't know what i'm looking at but with modifications to a light microscope such as phase contrast which alters the paths of light you actually can begin to see different cellular structures with a phase contrast microscope, because you alter the paths of light and you can see the different parts of the cell, you can actually look at living specimens without having to stain them. So you can see them pretty well. Um, there's another uh, modification that they call DIC, differential interference contrast microscopy. Um, same principle, it modifies the way that the light is transmitted so that you can again see better resolution of the structures. Um, okay, so this is fluorescence microscopy. You can sometimes tag structures in a cell or on a cell with a fluorescent label. Here they're using green and red. You can use them to stain an organelle. You can use them to stain a particular protein. Um, and then you shine light on that cell or protein, and the fluorescent molecule will basically reflect light back as a color. So it allows you to see more detail than you could with standard light microscopy, but it still takes advantage of the principles of light. You shine light at a molecule, that excites the molecule, the molecule releases light at a different wavelength, and you can detect that. Um, confocal microscopy is a modification of fluorescence. Um, it allows for, as hopefully you can see if you contrast these two images left and right, the image on the right has better resolution, looks clearer. So confocal microscopy uses lasers. And the really cool thing and the really terrible thing about doing confocal microscopy is you can look at basically one plane at a time. And so you can scan up 
and scan down. Um, and then the computer will take all of those images down and you can basically have a three-dimensional image of what it was in the field. I say it's a good and a bad thing because when you're looking at living cells, which is what I used to do, and they're very small living cells, they move. So sometimes you get a whole stack of them all together because the cells have moved. Sometimes being too precise can be difficult. But when you're looking at a fixed sample, so something that's not moving, um, you can get a really nice three-dimensional picture. But again, these are all based on the principles of blood. So at some point, you're going to run into a roadblock. You're not going to be able to magnify any further. You're not going to get any better resolution. You're not going to be able to see anything that's any smaller. So even though fluorescence microscopy and confocal microscopy are very cool, um, I did a PhD in bacteria that causes Lyme disease, which is really hard to see because it's pretty thin. We can see it pretty well with confocal microscopy, but still, what it looked like under a microscope, that's, it. that's what I saw under a microscope. No structure. I see no um, external protein. I see no membrane. I see a squiggle. Sometimes the squiggle is green and sometimes it's red. And I believe it was red. I didn't know if it was a lot. So, yeah, it was cool. I was like, yeah, I even published it. I was like, look at the pictures of the bacteria. They're so pretty. Yeah, they're green squiggles or red squiggles. But, you know, there were better pictures of squiggles than I would see. So I got to call them out. What would have been really fun, but really expensive, would have been to use something like electron microscopy to look at my squiggle. It would have been dead, which would have defeated the purpose because we were trying to see which ones were alive and which ones were dead. So in order to look at them under scanning electron, they'd all be dead. But it would have been a nice, pretty picture. So what you're looking at here is transmission versus scanning electron micrographs. So when you have a image that's been generated by the electron microscope, it's not really a picture, right? Because it's not a, a, a snapshot of what that thing looked like. It's a computer-generated image based on how the electron reflected off. So it's the computer's best guess at what it saw. So what a transmission electron microscope can do that's very cool is what you basically do is you take whatever it is you want to look at and you do a section of it. Like you cut it. And so you can see everything in the middle. So a transmission electron microscope, let's say this is, it looks like a bacterium to me. Maybe something like Staphylococcus, which is a round bacterium. So what transmission electron micro, oh actually, I can see it better now. It's not a bacterium, it's a, there's a sperm cell right here. Okay, so it's an egg, a human egg and a sperm cell. So here's the sperm cell. With the transmission electron microscope, though, the idea is you're seeing in the middle of the egg. The middle of, even if it was a bacteria, you're seeing in the middle of the bacteria. You're seeing what's going on, like if you picture an egg or a, or a bacterial cell or whatever, human cell, anything, like a cantaloupe. A transmission electron microscope is basically slicing that cantaloupe down the middle and looking at what's so you get to see the seeds, right, the fibers, you can see where the rind is. And so with that transmission electron microscope, you can see, okay, where does the cellular contents begin? Where's the membrane? What a scanning electron micrograph will be is what it looks like on the outside. It basically gives you a nice three-dimensional scan. So you've got the sperm cell attached. Right, which you don't see in the transmission because the sperm cell is already attached. Um, but you can see all of the like dimpling, it's not just a round ball. We could do the same thing we used to do when we scanned a cantaloupe. We could see all the dimpling on the cantaloupe, you'd see the little part where it was attached to the rest of the plant. So scanning the electron microscopy lets you get a nice image of the outside of something. Transmission lets you see what's going on on the inside. They're both really cool techniques. Uh, they both generate nice images, but their purposes are different. Uh, 
and transmissions have better magnification, better resolution. So transmission electronic proxy allows for visualization of viruses. So if you ever open a textbook and see a picture of a virus, it's because of electronic proxy, transmission electronic proxy. I think that's a good place to stop. We'll pick up on Monday with microscopy and research. So scientists here that use microscopes to answer questions. Please don't blow your hands off with fireworks. It happens every year. Enjoy your long weekend, and I will see you all on Monday. Um, please do pick your topic for your paper. I've opened a discussion thread on Canvas, um, and so you can pick whatever topic you want. Just don't pick a topic that somebody else already picked. Yes.